We suggest that you now go up the main staircase to the living quarters on the first floor. This huge area actually consists of three rooms, the living room, the library and the dining room, which can be separated from each other using a partition and a curtain. When Mr. and Mrs. Sonnefeld moved here, they left all their old furniture behind and bought everything new to match the architect-designed interior. One acquaintance of the family says that they weren't even allowed to keep any Persian rugs. Instead, they chose tubular steel furniture because it was modern, light and open. You can also see some of the old furniture, such as the bureau in front of the window where Mrs. Sonnefeld wrote her letters and the Steinway grand piano, played by her elder daughter, Puck who was very musical. This is where the Sonnefeld family and their guests ate their meals. They sat round the Huspen dining table, the one you see here is the original, and were served by one of the maids dressed in a smart white apron. If they needed anything, they could call her by pressing one of the buttons underneath each corner of the table. This is the room where food prepared in the kitchen was served through the serving hatch by one of the maids. The servants had to be up at 7.30 in the morning to get the breakfast ready and put the stove on. Life was one long cycle of washing and scrubbing, preparing tea, coffee and meals, and then clearing up afterwards. The library contains Mr. Sonnefeld's bureau, a fitted bookcase, and a small seat by the fireplace. The wall behind the fireplace is home to a number of ultra-modern gadgets. There's a clock connected to the electricity mains. Most of the rooms have these. This system was quite unusual for the time. Another novelty was the lighting in the library and sitting room, consisting of no fewer than 22 narrow strip lights on the ceiling. Here, Zeno Sonneveld Boss was born in 1886. Thanks to her husband's meteoric career, she had moved several rungs higher on the social ladder and spent most of her days looking after the house and reading. She received few visitors apart from a female friend who regularly came to tea. Mrs. Sonneveld had a big weakness for luxuries and status symbols. Whenever she went out, she'd wear a couple of items of jewellery, a long coat, usually fur-trimmed, and a hat with a hat pin. But she was primarily a practical woman who liked everything to be neat and tidy and hated wasting time and money. She must have loved this revolutionary interior because as well as being luxurious, it was practical and efficient. Imagine what the view would have been like from here, towards the River Maas. Nowadays, the Dirk Zicht Hospital is in the way. But in the early 1930s, there was a panoramic view. The Boyman's Van Berningen Museum was being built, along with a park full of villas for wealthy local people. But apart from that, it was all open space. During the Second World War, people took refuge here from the bombing, and Mrs. Sonnefeld reputedly took them cups of coffee. Rotterdam might have been in ruins, but Mrs. Sonnefeld got every one of her cups back unscathed. Bertus Sonnefeld was 14 when he joined the Van Nella Coffee, Tea and Tobacco Factory as its youngest employee in 1900. His ascent through the company was a rapid one. 
In 1919, he became deputy manager, and in 1935, he was appointed business director of the tobacco division, where he remained until he retired in 1950. As a self-made businessman, he was greatly respected at Van Nella, but he was not authoritarian and got on well with people from all walks of life. Sonneveld had a huge admiration for the United States, where he often went to buy tobacco. He used a lot of English words and had American tastes when it came to music and cars. His travel to the United States also gave him a taste for modern comforts, mainly as a result of staying in large hotels and on luxury liners. He loved clever inventions and gadgets, and his affinity for the Niwa Bauen movement was probably because it combined comfort, efficiency, and advanced technology. Niwa Bauen was an architectural movement that mainly took place in the 1920s and 1930s. Its architects believed that the design of a building should be based on its function, and traditional forms, ornamentation and monumentality were out. For this reason, Niwa Bauen was also known as New Realism or Functionalism. The functionalists were convinced that modern architecture was better than the traditional variety in a number of respects. Technically, ideologically, hygienically, and aesthetically. There are a lot of references to ship's architecture in House Sonnefeld. The architect, Leon van der Flucht, was fascinated by the idea of combining unique works of craftsmanship with the industrial look. Like many of the newer Bowen architects, he was greatly influenced by the work of the French architect, Le Corbusier. whose proper name was Magdalena, was born on July the 5th, 1913. She'd gone to a girls' school in Rotterdam, and then instead of going to the conservatoire, she trained as a secretary. In the summer of 1935, Park went to America for a year. She stayed with acquaintances of her father. Dozens of events were organized in her honor. Lunches, tea, picnics, dinner parties. Shortly after she arrived, 175 guests assembled on the roof terrace of the Ritz Hotel for a lunch in honor of this attractive brunette from Rotterdam. Ye, her real name was Hyacina, was born seven and a half years after Puck. Friends from the time recall how she was sometimes collected in the car by her mother, the only mother in Rotterdam to have her own car. She married a businessman, Leonard Coy, and the couple had a son, Leonard, in 1948. His father died when he was one, and Leo was brought up by his grandparents. <laughs> Hook slept in the blue bedroom and Hye in the yellow one. Hye's room was slightly smaller than Pook's, but it still had every modern convenience, including its own internal phone extension, a dressing table mirror, a connection to the central sound system, access to a balcony, and a reasonable amount of cupboard space. This is the spacious bedroom of Albertus and Hyazina Sonnefeld, with a balcony on two sides. The colors in this room are distinctly unusual. Not many people these days would choose metallic brown walls and window frames in combination with silver doorposts and a gray floor covering. But the bronze-like brown is a deliberate choice. In the color scheme developed for the house by the architect, brown was the color of the rooms used by the couple. Red, on the other hand, was for the staff. The grey floor covering wasn't the architect's first choice. He originally proposed linoleum, but then agreed to the more luxurious and comfortable wool carpet.
This striking green room was the dressing room of Mr. and Mrs. Sonnefeld. It's very cleverly designed. One side was for her and one for him. Here again, the emphasis is on practicality, which is why a little light goes on when the door opens, like a refrigerator. This was the Sonnefeld family's guest bedroom, though they probably didn't have very many guests. There are no fewer than 12 telephones in her Sonneveld, two outside ones and 10 house phones. In the 1930s, a telephone line was quite expensive. It cost nearly 100 guilders a year just for the line rental. But to the Sonnevelds, a telephone was an essential part of modern life, so the house was connected from the very outset. The kitchen was the maid's domain. They spent most of their time here, cooking, washing up, and doing other household chores. Mrs. Sonnefeld ran the household with a firm hand. She made the tea herself and browned the meat. There was a cult of tidiness in the house. Everything was put away as soon as it had been used, and the chrome always had to be gleaming. This separate staircase kept the family's living quarters strictly separated from those of the staff to ensure the maximum of privacy for the family. This separation was a great luxury, but there was also something old-fashioned and 19th century about it. Staff were a necessity, but they should be seen and not heard. The maids had their own bedrooms and a shared bathroom, much as the daughters of the family did. The bathroom has a separate wash basin for each maid, a substantial bath, and a heated towel rail. Mr. Sonnefeld believed everyone who lived in the house should have the same comforts, and the luxury afforded to the staff was the talk of Rotterdam. After tea in the evening, the maid could go to their rooms and listen to the radio or write letters, though they didn't have outside telephones. When they had time off, on Wednesday evenings and alternate Sundays, they had to be in by 10 o'clock. One of them, Jeanne Schrude, said that when her boyfriend brought her home on his bicycle, Mrs. Sonnefeld would watch from behind the living room curtains to make sure she was on time. She was a strict and demanding employer, but Jeanne Schrude described Mr. Sonnefeld as a darling. begin the this session uh, with Sabine Breitwasser, um, Judy Wharton, and as a respond, Elaine Relier as a respondent. Thank you very much. So, thanks to Gabriela Rangel and Jennifer Sorkin, of course, as well, for inviting me, and also to the PAC people. Actually, this was very good to see for me, because I just closed the show entitled Modernologies, presenting projects by artists investigating modernity and modernism, and I'm sure Judith would tell us which houses we have seen. I just recognized the view. And of course, a lot of things came to my mind when seeing this. I mean, we have a woman architect, someone like Schütteli Hotsky, who is known for his famous Frankfurt Kitchen, a very controversial project, a real 
very small kitchen, <laughs> very functional for the woman uh, in order to even speed up with her services. And talking about colors and power in architecture, to refer to another Austrian architect, Adolf Loos, not only because um, ornament was supposed to be a, gri a crime, uh, would, uh, often wrongly interpreted as he meant it, but those who have will have a chance to go to Prague and see the house Müller. There's a tiny room, the room to receive the services for mail or any kind of services, which is painted in a color, in a dark violet color, hard to stand, so the architect made sure everyone will leave immediately, not starting to talk with the owner of the house. And there are, of course, a lot of other important aspects in this house. And I make a total switch because I'm talking about something very, very different. And the title of my talk is From Female Creativity to Practices of Feminism, Several Women Initiatives in Austria. I'm introducing and I'm showing also some images. Okay, so what I would like to start off by introducing actually one of the first women's initiatives in the arts, actually the first all-women exhibition in Europe organized by Vienna-based artist Vadi Expert, already quoted today. And also to clarify, actually, this reenactment by Marina Bramovic, which was a total misunderstanding of Vadi's work, because this work, the genital panic, genital panic, as this piece is called, was never performed as such live. This was a poster project in the city of Vienna. So it was a billboard project. and. Before, in a previous action, Vali used this pant where the crouch was cut off by entering public cinemas and entering through the narrow rows, through the narrow rows of seatings and um, so far doing this intervention in the movie. So, but it was never, never performed like Marina Bramovic performed it. And I think I should say that. So at that time, when Vali organized her show, started to go into that subject, the prevalent or preferred phrasing was, as I'm uh, quoting in my title, female creativity, which was the subject of her investigation and, presenta and presentation. And in citing a case study of a contemporary initiative, I will also discuss the activities of a forum of young female artists, likewise based in Vienna, that got together in 2001 in order to explore and expand how they called it practices of feminism in the arts. It was a loose collective and they called themselves a room of one's own. It operated as an open structure, so it was not an artist group or collective as such. And it undertook research actions, collective presentations until 2005. Um, it's not my objective now to simply juxtapose these two initiatives, rather I will give a detailed reading of the text published by the initiatives, initiate, initiators of these two projects, and I will also take a closer look at different approaches and methodologies in the 1970s and today. And, um, I did this especially referring to the topic of this conference, questioning what has the younger generation learned from the uh, predecessors? How do they implement the legacy of feminist practices into their own aesthetic practices to take up a question from Gabriela's paper? And I will also mention two further examples. So my talk will have some like four chapters. I'll see as far we go. And I'll start with female creativity. Just to say a little bit more about Vali Expert and in terms of media. Vali is one of those artists who declared herself explicitly as a media artist. This was, as I remember still, a really important statement by artists in the 70s. And she's also a pioneer in this regard, both in her cinematic and her video work. She was very active in a movement which was called Expanded Cinema, which was very different than the movement with the same name in the US expanded move cinema as Vali understood it or Peter Weibel was very much more related to her actions. And um, 
will show a short film, a short TV work by her. It's just five minutes. I'll give you a short intro. It's called Facing a Family. And this work, which the artist refers actually to an expanded movie, is a TV action as well, and she calls it also an imaginary screen. And this is a piece, and it's one of the rare great moments where artists could collaborate with this institution. Usually it failed. It was commissioned, in fact, by the Austrian National Television, and it was also broadcast on February 28th. 71, actually, within the scope of a TV ser series with a very visionary um, person running this. He lost his job, actually, at the end. <laughs> As the series was called Contacte Contacts, and the topic being addressed where Wally conceived this work was family and TV isolation. So let's have a look. And I must say, the English subtitles, it was no, not shown with English subtitles, of course, so... Didn't you try reverse? Hmm? Okay, I will read and maybe we manage in between. So I will read a short text um, by the artist taken from a storyboard or a scheme of this work, how she um, poses this work. Facing a family TV action and it also gives you an idea in case it will not work. <laughs> also, we tested it. Um, TV action. Two families sit face to face. One in the TV set, the other at home. No program is visible since the screen that one family is looking at is also the screen of the other. And she mentioned the specification canvas being transmitted to the TV. What one sees, what you're not seeing now, is the reaction to the program. This reaction in turn is the same as in the audience, since the reaction of this family still or also represents it's another performance we're doing now. Um, also represents a program for the other family. And she mentioned that the whole thing can last like five to twenty minutes. Television in the family, the family in television. You think you will manage? You have to put it down to the to you have to pull it down to the DVD. I'm not a technician. It's not the entire. No, that's the wrong one. That we don't want. <laughs> you have to put it, but you can. Sure, there are buttons. In the beginning. Well, in the beginning, you have four icons. This one. Yeah, that's it. Okay. There's some. Yeah.
Jetzt kommt er. Gut, sieht er. Komm. Jetzt die Sportredaktion. Guten Abend, verehrte Zuschauer. Sapphore, auch Japans <lacht> Mainz genannt, steht hier zwischen den Schwungen. Wo auch jetzt der ruhig? Die Millionenstadt auf der Insel Hakaido ist bekanntlich Austragungsort der Olympischen Winterspiele 1972. Zu den vorolympischen Spielen, die von 23 Nationen beschickt wurden, werden aus aller Welt härteste Kritiken gemeldet. So klagte Österreichs Vizedelegierter Ingenieur über den Spiel, das dass die Veranstalter trotz heftigster Einwände durch die technischen Kommission. The subtitles are just translation for the TV. Of the sound of the TV. Yeah. We can stop it, I think it's okay. Kein Interesse daran zeigen, die vielen vorhandenen Mängel abzustellen bzw. Okay, so Export started her critical studies and analysis of television quite early actually and in this specific work she investigated the coding of reality and its perceptions through an electronic medium like television that is depicting and representing reality for a rather large audience. The screen function, as the artist also emphasized, an imaginary canvas and represents exactly the interface where the subject experiences separation and difference. When export is mirroring the typical post-World War II middle-class family, parents with the children, one boy, one girl, sitting at the dining table in front of, or as the artist emphasized, in one of the most important symbols of the Wirtschaftswunder, the economic miracle of, of um, after Second World War, the, which was the TV set, she's in fact representing the very narrow and not less programmatic social environment of women of these times, even through the reality of the new technologies, the electronic media. One year earlier, in 1970, um, Valley Expert and her companion of that time, Peter Weibel, published a legendary anthology entitled Bild Compendium Wiener Aktionismus und Film, which would translate to Image Compendium of Viennese Actionism and Film, an anthology of images and works of films by the Vienna actionists, including the editor's work. For the first time, the radical exploration of the body as a medium for an artwork, as undertaken by the actionists. Authorities have since evaluated this book as pornographic, and the two editors, Export and Weibel, were indeed and convicted for violating the Youth Protection Act. In a second trial, Valley Expert even lost legal custody of her daughter. If reality is a social construct and man are its engineers, we are faced with a male reality, writes Expert in her manifesto in 1972, Women's Art, published a year later. This manifesto starts with a statement that says the position of art in the women's movement is the position of the women in the art movement. Export continues to request that the floor be given to the woman so they to the women so they can find themselves. And further on she demands that we women must participate in the construction of reality through the media. Indeed, actually, this manifesto was the starting point for the first all-women's exhibition in Europe. The exhibition involved comprehensive research by expert herself, who was visiting women and women's group that were dealing with the disadvantages um, encountered from being a woman in various areas and disciplines, so not only visual artworks, actually. It also took her some time to convince an art institution to host the project, and in the end it was, it was reduced to mainly Austrian artists in the actual exhibition, although Export had collected material from both Europe and the United States. Her letters to institutions in England, Germany, and the Netherlands offering to present the exhibition there as well were not crowned with success. Most of the institutions didn't even feel the need to respond to her letter. Finally, in 1975, the exhibition Magna, Feminismus, Kunst und Kreativität, which was translated to Magna, Feminism, Art and Creativity, took place at the Avantgarde Gallery next San Stefan. This is a uh, it was a really important avant-garde gallery started in the 50s actually by priests and is located, it's still existing, it's run as a commercial gallery now near the famous St. Stephen's Gallery, that's why it has his name, Nick St. Stefan. And we can show the first image. 
of the PowerPoint. <laughs> On the cover of the catalog, which we'll see soon, the exhibition was announced as a survey on female sensibility. There's a PowerPoint. As a, a survey on female sensibility, imagination, projection, and problematics suggested through a tableau of pictures, objects, photographs, lectures, discussions, readings, films, and video screenings, and actions. In her introduction to the catalog of Magna, Valley Expert writes about her intention, motivated by reports on the energy of the women's movement in the United States to organize a European Women's Symposium on female creativity, including an exhibition and screening actions and so on. All of which were, and I'm quoting the artist, meant to make manifest the new consciousness of the woman, strengthening it through the impact on the public. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so you have, it's gone. <laughs> the cover and the index, and I'm sorry, I apologize, I guess you can't read the index, but I'll give you an idea what was going on. Magna introduced fine arts videos and, as I mentioned, film screens by female artists such as Friedel Bondi, who was later um, had the name Friedel Kubelka when she got married to Peter Kubelka, Valley expert Rebecca Horn, Birgit Jürgensen, Maria Lasnik, Friederike Petzold, Katharina Siemerding, among many others, writings by Elfriede Gerstel, Elfriede Jelinek, Frederike Mayröck and others were presented in public readings. Music by Dorothy Janone and Franca Sacchi were performed. And in the symposium, a series of lectures by Peter Gorsen, Gislind Nabakowski, and among many others, introduced art theory and history on the subject in the frame of what was an annual talk, usually hosted by the gallery and um, provided to the artist as a structure. In her manifest, expert wrote, and I'm quoting her again, art can be a medium of our self-determination that brings new values for the art, that respective values that will change the reality through cultural sign processes towards an adjustment of female needs. And the last one comes in capitalized, the future of the women will be the future of the history of the women. In this catalog, she also published a short survey on the history of the women in art history, um, where she further elaborates on the subject. And I'm quoting her again, if, as has been maintained, the repossession of women has been a historic necessity for the development of humankind, so is now, too, the liberation of the women. The catalog also contains an interview that was conducted by expert with artist Merit Oppenheim, the Swiss artist who collaborated with the Surrealists, and it reprints a German translation of a text by Lucy Lippard, who was in close contact with Wally at that time, titled Why a Separate Women's Art. This was a German translation from a text previously published in New York in a catalog um, uh, 10 artists and in the magazine Art and Artists in 73. Art, art critic Lippard, who in the same year published her volume on the dematerialization of the art object that actually concludes its documentation on conceptual art practices, in 1972 writes in this catalog, and I'm quoting Lucy Lippard, Art critics still don't hesitate to use the word feminine in a judgmental context, one that once caused women to avoid integrating gentle lines, soon materials, household items, as well as pastel colors, especially pink, into their works of art. Nowadays, women are certainly far from considering it to be a major compliment when being told they paint like men. Works by female artists that are shown in various exhibitions or similar collections originate from such a wide range of different art movements that is nearly impossible to speak of a feminine art per se. And yet, there is no doubt that the female world of experience differs sociologically and biologically from that of the male. 
If art actually comes from inside as it should, then it has to manifest in different ways. And I go on to a second project uh, by Vali Export from the 80s, which is uh, titled Kunst mit Eigensinn, which, I mean, there would be probably hundreds of translation. I would call it art with a self-will, and we can, uh, yeah, here is it, the cover of the catalog. In 1985, Vali Export and Silvia Eibelmeier, in collaboration with Heidi Grundmann, in charge of the video section, and Katrin Pichler for the catalog, organized what they called, in the subtitle, the International Exhibition of Current Art by Women. Kunst mit Eigensinn. This large survey of art by women presented at the former Museum des 20. Jahrhunderts, Museum of 20th Century, another modernist building, by the way, uh, also comprehended a program with performances, film and video screenings, and a three-day symposium on the topic, which was Female Aesthetics, Fiction, Idea, or Realistic Project, as it read. This project, in fact, represented what Export more or less has had already intended in the 1970s. It introduced about 80 female artists in the exhibition from all over the world. Um, Helen Almeida, whose work is on the cover, Barbara Bloom, Sophie Kallen, Helen Chadwick, Isa Gensken, Jenny Holzer, Barbara Kruger, Maria Lasnik, Lea Lublin, Cindy Sherman, Nancy Spiro, or, the, or Adriana Shimatova, just to name a few. Additionally, it put on a comprehensive program with film and video screenings and, as I mentioned, another international symposium. In her introduction, expert quotes excerpts from her 1972 manifesto and elaborates as follows on the context of organizing such a project in the 80s. And I'm quoting her again when I'm... Present day society is no longer one where women are isolated without rejoinder in the scope of discourse. The subversive strategies and provocations of the 1960s and 1970s have transformed the profile of this society, have made its face more humane. Through its fissures, a new sense of meaning has risen to the surface like a periscope. The few point according to which social unity is considered to be founded upon family sacrifice is losing its pathos. The home no longer remains the place of socialization and parents no longer remain the facilitators of self-realization. The stratification of social processes as a cause of inequality cannot be quantitatively <laughs> suspended, but must suspend itself. Art with the self will represent such an implosion of the stratification of contention with the other quality. Through historical exposure, the woman experiences history as skin, as a form of coalescence. In the perception of this disparity, she grapples from the future of a new history which will become a medium of her self-realization. That's what Expert wrote in, um, about 10 years later. So I'm switching to a current initiative, as I have announced, the forum A Room of One's Own. Uh, taking up the question, how does a younger generation of female artists respond to the legacy of the earlier movement of feminism and its initiatives? So less than, um, yeah, it's too early, but it's okay. Less than 30 years after Magna in 2001, the Female Artists Collective, A Room of One's Own, premiered at the Vienna Secession with an exhibition entitled Experiment 2A. Contrary to export self-initiative, this project arose from an opportunity. Artist, Vienna-based artist again, Carola Teatnik was invited for a show at the Vienna Secession within the framework of a series called the Experiment, the Experiment initiated by artist and board member Dorit Markreiter, who was only inviting female curators. And I'm quoting from the catalog and the website of the collective. Um, about their mission. The motivation to initiate the forum was a result of the recognition that feminist practices have not yet reached the point that radical theories bring into focus. We are um, 
now here, uh, nowhere near being able to rest on the warm cushions that our mothers and grandmothers fought to give us, end of quote. With these words, the initiative which uh, seized its activities in the year 2005 introduced itself on the website and a room of one's own was of course not only explicitly referring to Virginia Woolf's uh, famous essay from 92, which was already quoted by Valley Expert in her Magna catalog, and thus to the historical roots of the women's movement, it also understood itself program programmatically as a forum of young women artists for discussing, investigating, and expanding contemporary feminist discourses and practices. And I'm quoting again from uh, what we will call now the mission. The context occupied through feminist struggles must be repeatedly redefined and worked over. For this reason, it's uh, necessary to pick up at the point where the generations before us stopped and to continue working with the feminist history that exists so far. While male colleagues are thus almost automatically provided with the whole package, like a professorship, a retrospective in the museum, and a place in history, it is evident that the young contemporary female artists usually persevere in subculture emerge with a brief success only to vanish again. With the exception of the one woman per generation, this one woman then has the multidisciplinary function of covering every section of art and representing a balanced relationship to the outside. The women artists of the same generation have already disappeared again, and the next generation can barely remember their predecessors, let alone discover their traces in archives and libraries. For this reason, this forum was initiated in order to create an open field in which a discourse can be established for actively processing feminist issues with processual strategies and thus positing new actions. So what are these new actions alike? And I'm, you see, and I'm explaining that. In the exhibition Experiment 2B, following the first one at the secession uh, in 2002, a year after, the collective presented the results of the current research through an audio installation that provided access to interview material. Skirts for sale were especially produced for the exhibition and printed with questions and statements taken. Yeah, um, five minutes. Yeah, okay. Um, taken. Uh, with the statements from the discussions. Because of their simple rectangular cut, the skirts could be easily transformed into banners with political messages. A demonstration video playfully explained the practice of wearing skirts and using banners. Maybe we can quickly show the video, not the entire, no, not the, we have to switch to the video. Yeah, this we do later. But I'm continuing to read and, and this, the, we go back to them. Over the course of its history, and I'm quoting again the uh, collective, the skirt has been an article of clothing for both women and men. Accordingly, it is used in this exhibition as a metaphor for gender bending, starting from an expanded concept of space, wearing skirts, carrying banners, and you saw the banners in the um, uh, sh slide before, takes the statements and demands out of an art context into the surrounding of everyday life. Feminism is not a separate discourse, but has significance for the whole of society. And they had uh, created another statement, which in German reads, feministische Forderungen sind tragbar. Yeah, yeah, it has sound, and I'm just, feminist demands are fitting. We just look quickly into this. This is uh, Sophie Thorsen, one of the collective members. As it is often with collectives, no one is responsible for the work, so it was very hard for them to find the video, so I'll have to show it otherwise. <laughs> it, I think five people spread all over Europe were searching for the video, <laughs> collectively produced, so. <laughs> yeah. We can keep it and I go reading and then we um, can reduce the sound maybe, uh, so you can have a look. 
goes for five minutes. If you just turn down the sound and we keep, yeah, yeah. To me, the most radical action of um, a room of one's own is the donation of the early work of the collective to 10 of the most powerful and leading art museums they have chosen as examples for their contemporary exhibition and collective collection practices. This intervention into the usually male-dominated collections in museums was part of the exhibition Mothers of Invention, West Performance Coming From, which took place in the Museum of Modern Art in Vienna in 2004, organized by two members of the group, Carola Dertling and Stephanie Seibold, which intended to demonstrate how performance is intertwined with political and social issues, and thus contributing to a reassessment of historical and contemporary performance strategies particularly by women. They have sent letters announcing the donation to directors of the museum, like Museum of Modern Art in New York, um, the Vienna Museum, of course, Moderna Museum. So the whole uh, uh, group of leading art museums. And, um, and they showed the letter in Vienna as an object, like blown up and displayed it in the exhibition. With this action of the donation of the early work, uh, they intended, and I'm quoting them again, to mirror the incompleteness of the patriarchal historiography of art based on institutional representation and a traditional notion of the art object. This manifests in the obvious hesitancy of institution to incorporate women into the art canon and in the low visibility of feminist art production. The donation, therefore, turns the game of the possession and transfer of concept and products into a feminist strategy whereby aspects of capitalism's logic are infiltrated and recharged with new meanings. And they created a very nice slogan again, which I would like to read. It's gift till they shift. And I'm just finishing with the last chapter very quickly, but it's important um, about another artistic practice which um, commonly used rewriting history. And I would just briefly present two projects, one again by Carola Dertnik, and we can go over to the images, and her work Laura Sana from 2005, which resulted, and it's important to connect with the early work by Vali Export. Yeah, finishing, yeah. Uh, with her research on female participants in the original actionist performance. And we'll see the image of a work done by a fictive character named Laura Sana, which was an actionist, age 62. It was actually the wife of Bruce, of Günther Bruce, who draw its draw over images of documentation of legendary actionist performances and taking on an active role. And, um, Yes, and there's another one. And she showed this with a text quoting a statement by Annie Bruce, actually, which I don't have the time to read now. And briefly, the final one. Yeah, that's a work by Anna Attack, another Austrian artist. She's also a philosopher. And she's working, again, on the legacy of pioneering feminist artists. And this is one of 10 plates of a series called The Unknown Avant-Garde from 2008, where she sort of investigates female members or associates of uh, very known avant-garde groups represented through the typical group photography, and she shows the photograph with a, a, a label, it was shown, um, indicating other members. And she did it on, uh, starting from the group, Tajet group in Moscow, 1913, ending with the Austrian Filmmakers Corporation, 68. And this was just one example of the abstract expressionist. And I would like to end with a quote um, kind of translating from Susan Sontag, Anna uses also in the booklet to distribute this work, which she sees as a sort of very important piece to distribute, where Susan Sontag says the photographer, and they would use the general term artist, is not simply the person who records the past, but the one who invents it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh. Yeah. Should 
te aviso. Yo te aviso. Do I need a, do you talk Spanish? When? Do you talk Spanish? Um, if you want me, I can speak yeah, in English too. Um, I would prefer to speak in Spanish, but uh, okay. Um, first of all, uh, the movie that we previously uh, saw, this functional family, was a movie that was shot in uh, Rotterdam, and it was a public commission of the city that in which they published like seven pieces to seven artists. And uh, I asked this movie to be screened on public TV so people could watch it in their homes. And uh, now I will present you uh, with another piece that I'm working on, and it's uh, a piece that it's continuing, and I don't know when it's going to end, that is called uh, Obras Contadas, or Recounting the Work. And um, it's basically, uh, I invite artists and curators, historians, and people that are in the art world to um, write in a book, which is this one, composition book, um, stories, uh, manuscripts about pieces that were told to them, but they have never seen. And these manuscripts um, are going to be uh, part um, at eventually um, of a book. So now we're going to see some of it, and I will be the reader. Can we turn off the lights? The beginning, please. Estábamos cenando en la casa de Mike, no recuerdo bien si fue Stefan o quién, que me contó, que estaba en la mesa que me lo contó. Un artista entra en una librería, busca las estanterías hasta encontrar un libro de poesía. Se acomoda en el piso, pasan las horas, lee, lee, lee. De repente se levanta abruptamente y corre hacia la salida de la librería como si se estuviera robando algo. Los guardias de seguridad se arrebatan detrás de él, lo alcanzan, lo toman de los brazos y durante el recorrido hacia la oficina de seguridad para revisarlo, él les recita el poema que se acaba de robar. When I was a student at the New York Studio School in the late 60s, Milton Resnick told this story. We were talking about the final mark, the one that is needed to finish a painting, to pull it all together. He told me that if you could make that mark, and it was the right one, you would feel the floor shake and the walls tremble and then the walls of your studio would fall down and you would see all the other buildings around you also collapse until only the painting will be standing in the midst of the rubble.
No recuerdo quién me contó esta acción. Tampoco el nombre del artista, ni el lugar, ni la fecha. Pero la recuerdo, y eso es suficientemente significativo como para volver a contarla. Un artista hizo una gran lupa con un bloque de hielo. Con la lupa concentró los rayos del sol y provocó un incendio. No sé tampoco si será factible, pero no importa. Someone once told me about a work involving a video camera, a pirate VHF, UHF broadcaster, and a biplane. Maybe some high power magnesium lamps were involved as well. The artist and a pilot, maybe the same person, would fly the said plane over a suburban neighborhood with the camera aimed at the houses below. I included the lamps in my own version because how else would the setup work at night? Although I guess the artist may have done it during the day. Anyway, this was in the days of analog broadcast television, when most people received their TV signal through set-top antenna, rabbit ears. The plane flew really low. I imagine dangerously low and buzzed the roofs of the houses. The plane not only, not only was videoing the houses, but was also broadcasting the live feed from the pirate BHF UHF device. TV viewers nested into their couches would first hear the plane, and as the plane approached, the sound of the engines magnified, and suddenly the image on TV was replaced by a moving image of the viewer's house from above. The plane roared over. The perplexed viewer rubbed his or her eyes in disbelief. And then the miniature televisual house was replaced by the, by the Price is Right or Johnny Carson or Tom and Jerry or whatever people watch when set-top receivers were the going thing. I'm not sure who did this insane intervention or who told me about it. I'm skeptical whether it would even work, but I wouldn't mind trying it myself someday. El proyecto era difícil, pero no imposible. Sobre todo, revolucionaría el sistema educativo de la humanidad. Ricardo estaba exhausto porque el momento había llegado. Se trataba de construir un prototipo de aula. 
Los profesores eran la clave. El banco tendría un agujero por el cual pasaría un palito redondo y la tabla del banco estaría, en la tabla del banco estaría un resorte, de modo que a medida que el niño se sentaba, el palito iría penetrando en el culo del niñito. El maestro, entre tanto, estaría en una hamaca, en el techo del aula, en un rincón. De este modo, se lograría que todos los niñitos tuvieran abierta la cola y, por lo tanto, escaparían del terror a la penetración anal. Al cambiar el patrón de la masculinidad, la sociedad se volvería mucho más democrática e igualitaria. I barely remember anything about this piece, but I was told about it in the kitchen of a friend's apartment. One of his students had made a piece that seemed really exciting. I think she kept a pea seed in her mouth until it sprouted. I have no idea what happened next. For some reason, I also th think she either was a nurse and went to art school or vice versa. Lawsuit. Muchas gracias. Okay, so I want to thank um, everybody here and Gabriella and Jenny and uh, Emmy and all the people at. Uh, oh, there's another one. Uh, uh, and all the people at SeaTac and at PAC, um, and also um, Sabine and um, and Judy for letting me be the respondent to their presentations. I'm going to start my response with <clears throat> what was actually perhaps the initial move in putting together uh, this panel, which is the title and short introductory paragraph that Gabriella and Jenny sketched out 
as a frame for the presentations by Sabine and Judy and myself. And the distinction that is asked to be made and elaborated on in that introduction between feminist artists organizing in the 70s and 80s and artistic practices today. It's a question perhaps about the history referred to in our panel's very intriguing, very curious title, Make Your Own History. Inspired by that title, I'll try out one possible distinction between then and now. And to do this, I'll use some illustrations from various places that fall somewhere between Sabine and her presentation and Judy and her presentation and myself and Mexico City, which has brought us all together here tonight. Ah, so this is my first example. It comes from the early 1990s and the sudden explosion of biennials around the globe at the time. <clears throat> so already perhaps uh, there's a difference being marked here between now and when Valley Export was putting together the exhibition Magna since, as Sabine just told us, she was denied the resources to make the international exhibition she envisioned and instead had to limit the participants to Austrians only. Anyway, my first example is this installation called Ramona's Bedroom, which San Diego artists David Avalos and Deborah Small constructed for the third international biennial held in 1992. Uh, the, the title of the show was The Production of Cultural Difference, and this was the show that really put the Istanbul Biennial on the map, as it were, as it did its young curator, uh, Vasif Korten. In the catalog, Korten describes Istanbul in terms that resonate strongly with the piece here by Avalos and Small and how it figures their experience of the San Diego, Tijuana metropolitan area. Korten writes that Istanbul is not a center but rather a place, quote, in the middle, situated between North and South and severing Asia from Europe in the manner of a non-space, end quote. The United States Information Agency had asked Pat Chavez at San Diego's Central Cultural de la Raza to put together the U.S. contingent for the biennial, which also included Amelia Mesa Baines along with Avalos and Small, but then the agency withdrew its support because of what it saw as the artist's denunciation of Christopher Columbus as a notorious introducer of imperialism into the Western Hemisphere. The artists did end up securing last minute independent support and thus were able to participate in the show after all. And yet, both Thomas McElvey in Art Forum and Adrian Donat in Flash Art reported that visitors to the Istanbul Biennial found Avalos and Small's work, quote, parochial and self-absorbed, native this and native that, too predictably narrowly other. So the second example comes from the very next year, 1993, when the curator, Peter Weibel, who was mentioned in Sabine's talk, asked the artist Christian Philip Mueller to participate along with Andrea Frazier and Gerald Rockenschwab, <laughs> yeah, Schaub, pardon, as a representative of the, to participate as a representative of the, of the Austrian pavilion at the Venice Biennale. The work Mueller produced for the occasion was Green Border. This is a still. In the months prior to the Biennale, Mueller assumed the disguise of a hiker and, accompanied by a photographer, set out from Austria to cross the nation's border illegally into each of the country's eight neighboring nation states. Mueller would choose a costume with which to tra traverse the boundary line between the states based on national cliches, thus supposedly minimizing his chances of being detected. To enter Liechtenstein, he obtained a horse and riding gear. To step over into Hungary, he uh, brought along a dog on a leash. Mueller's work ended up becoming somewhat iconic, you can go to the next slide, in the following years. Being written about by James Meyer and Mi Wan Kwan, uh, he made the cover of Mi Wan Kwan's book, being written about as exemplary of what they saw as a new form of institutional critique and site-specific art arising in the 1990s. New because <clears throat> it treated site and institutions as mobile and flexible. That is, what they saw in Mueller 
in Mueller's green border work was a piece that was specific to the site for which it was, uh, um, or in which it was commissioned, but which treated that site as discursive or as constituted by custom and historical narratives, institutional codes, disciplinary or professional bodies of knowledge, bureaucratic rules, legal parameters, all overlapping, some mutually uh, reinforcing, others uh, contradictory, and also by the particular readings given to such sites by their visitors and users based on the particular subject position of each. Site thus becomes more opened up, more like a matrix of shifting, overlapping, and extensive information, which viewers interact with differently based on their differing identities and social situations. Site-specific art moves away from anything physically fixed and anchored, and instead takes up the task of negotiating interfaces and feedback loops, the tasks of searching and retrieving and assembling ever new batches of research from an always changing stew of data that site now comes to represent. And these artworks, usually commissioned and performed as services, also grow increasingly temporary and ever-changing. You see this in the growing number of artworks that take the form of temporary projects and social participation. Thus, while context-dependent and therefore e embedded, the work at the very same time becomes informational, fleeting and therefore disembedded, always in transaction with its site and always moving from one site to another. I'm trying to phrase this to sound somewhat contradictory and strange, but it should be actually very familiar, and it's very, very current, and I would want to say it's even normative today. It corresponds well to today's general communicational and <clears throat> informational dictates and protocols, and is experienced, you can go to the next slide, less like this kind of world and perhaps more like this, like a network, at least by those who are more apt to be swept up by the freer flows of capital and information, rather than those who are apt to experience mobilities simultaneously greater administration, politicization, and restriction. Perhaps this change informs the tendency of art institutions today to grow more open and porous and to extend exhibitions communicationally, to transform static object display and monologue into ongoing semiotic interaction and dialogue. And I would almost want to kind of hold up at least a certain aspect of the last piece that you just performed as a kind of almost a um, you know, representation of that kind of idea. No more institutions, no more even artworks, just the, the, the performed communication of, of art from one audience to another. <clears throat> Exhibition venues increasingly rely on residencies and commissions on more flexible approaches to display and place greater emphasis on information and discussion. Such trends have encouraged and been encouraged by the growing number of artworks like the ones that Mi Wan Quan and James Meyer write about, works that take the form of temporary projects, service prov provision, and social participation. With the increasing adoption of such itinerant post-studio approaches, sites of art production become more mobile in a manner made familiar by trends in capitalist production per se under conditions of globalization. Trends like the shift to on-demand or just-in-time production, to outsourcing and temporary work teams. Thus, both the artist's studio with its presumed autonomy and the museum with its permanent collection representing official or national or canonical culture now fade as emblems of a former division and stalemate between the spheres of production and recuperation and are superseded by more temporal, elapsing events, spaces of fluid interchange between objects, activities, and people. You can go to the next one. This development also happens in tandem. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah. I'll actually go to the very next one. One. We'll come back to that one. No, the next one. Then, yeah, okay. This development also happens in tandem with the rise of a new subjectivity, a subject that is also at once embedded and disembedded. An older description of such a subject was perhaps the traveling merchant or trader, but more recently we know it as the networker or freelance consultant, an unfamiliar face that comes as, comes as if out of nowhere with things to swap and exchange, 
then just as quickly disappears. There's a striking similarity between this description and today's popular figure of the nomad. Or at least, it sounds strikingly similar when the critic Jean Cricchi, just a few years after Philip Mueller's piece, describes the artist Gabriel Orozco as a nomad in a long monograph published in Art Forum. Quote, a flaneur of the planet, Cricchi says of Orozco, the nomad artist ultimately has at his disposal and as sole recourse only himself. The nomad sensibility favors the light and the transitory over the monumental in the figure of the freelancer to that of the businessman, end quote. Since the business of the nomad or networker is about exchange and feedback, this kind of figure, though independently mobile, is at the same time embedded, or at least more exteriorized, that is constituted not by some a priori interior self that remains always the same from one moment or situation to the next, but rather by input into and feedback out of the subject's changing external surroundings. And it's hard not to imagine that that, that it's in order to accommodate this kind of figure that more and more businesses, you can go back one, more and more businesses and organizations and services now publicize themselves through the use of the program, uh, the pronoun you. And it per perhaps is bound up with their ubiquitous mantra that you uh, hear um, about doing it yourself or DIY culture. It might even be bound up with the naming of this panel make your own history. Even museums now, can you go to two more? Yeah, so you have the Van Abbey Museum publicizing a gallery there called Your Space. Um, you can go to almost any uh, museum, the large museum's website and they'll have a place where you can customize the canon and make your museum. Um, calling a space or a canon or a history yours radically decenters and opens it up since using the pronoun you keeps the designation of the object as flexible as possible. That is, what you refers to is radically contingent. It changes from moment to, to moment depending on who's involved and what they're doing and where they're doing it and when. Well, there's been much about this transition I'm trying to describe that should be applauded, this transition from more kind of closed um, uh, mon monolithic, monological forms to more open, dialogical, and flexible forms. I w would argue that, um, that this new state of affairs has been over-romanticized in the art world. Um, and to be sure, there's others who have been critical of this. For instance, writers such as Susan, Susan Bordo and Janet Wolfe have identified the somewhat suspicious timing by which gender in the singular evaporates and the subject <clears throat> is decentered and dispersed just at the moment in which women gain some power in critical discourse in academic institutions as they're discovering their subjectivities and their identity. <clears throat> Likewise, Marco Sanchez Tranquilino and John Tagg, writing in 1992, described bitterly how, quote, those who never made it now arrive to find the museum in ruins. Their identity is already gone, their culture in fragments, their nationhood dispersed, and their monuments reduced to canonical rubble. Welcome to the new art history. There's room for everyone and a place for none. What are we on now? Oh, that's fine. Now, when this kind of, <clears throat> with this kind of, this kind of framing device that I've come up with here, when it's placed on the group of, uh, the work by the group of younger feminists that Sabine spoke of, a room of one's own, what comes to the fore is indeed a kind of dispersive aspect to the work, a room for everyone, as Tranquilino, uh, Sanchez Tranquilino and, and Tag call it. Um, the, root, the group describes itself as, quote, <clears throat> an open structure that allows different perspectives um, to join at any time in the search for possible new directions. Um, it allows for an interplay of forces that produces a constructive accumulation of contradictions. This is off of their website. <clears throat> Definitely, these, this kind of 
centrifugal characterization of the group's project stands in contrast to some of the more centripetal metaphors that Valley Export uses in the, the excerpts that you read, um, especially where she talks about experiencing history as a kind of coalescence in skin, something that you grapple with, and that through the grappling, it becomes a medium for self-realization, very kind of centripetal uh, kind of description. But a room for one's own is obviously, <clears throat> at the same time, about establishing a place. Not a place for no one, but a place, a place of belonging, even a space of relative autonomy. It's one of the meanings that uh, calling themselves a room of one's own is about. And the sense that this room does have a distinct border, an inside and outside, this comes out in the pronoun that they choose to use, which is our, right, which implies an exclusion, even though it's an open pronoun, a shifter, it also uh, instigates uh, a stark conclusion in its performance. This makes, makes me want to say something about, can you go to the next one? No, not that one. I don't know how that slipped in there. No, the next one after that cookie one. Yeah, this is the house and that was featured in Judy's first film tonight. Um, this makes me want to say something, uh, something similar about uh, Judy's first film that we saw. Um, that is, it's a representation, that film is a representation, a very complicated representation of also a room, or at least a set of rooms, or a house. <clears throat> Which means, or I'd want to say that it, it, it gets at, or it, 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 it's, it's about underlying uh, arrangements. It's a representation of a kind of habitus that uh, is built on multiple divisions of labor and hierarchies. A habitus that <clears throat> is, um, that inculcates practices uh, that themselves structure are, and are structured by social inequalities. Um, and it does this Right? It looks as the ha at the house, as a lot of uh, feminist practice does, as a kind of like very, very deep structure, even while it acknowledges Rotterdam as an, an, a city of incredible diversity, a city in which I think over 50% of the population is now people who are not born Dutch. Um, and it also kind of um, you know, has the obvious metaphors of, of non-belonging, uh, especially with um, the tourists constantly traipsing through the scenes with their little booties on, um, which are so, you know, I, I see those and I always think of the CSI programs on that saturate uh, American television. Do you get the reference to CSI? The criminal investigation uh, television? Okay. Um, and it, even, even the image of modernism that is in Judy's film is itself somewhat bifurcated between being about a kind of modernist enterprise of extreme reduction, functionalism, efficiency, again, a kind of maybe centripetal force, um, and also, you know, you can't get away from the fact that one of the influences gotten from Le Corbusier was Le Corbusier's love of, of, of cabins of mobility, of the insides of boats and trains and um, airplanes. I guess I will just wrap up by saying that, that um, in this way, not only does, does um, the image of the room, and this also goes for the room that was in the Valley Export uh, video of the family eating dinner in front of the TV set, I don't want to say that, that, that trying to get at things like the habitus or the family home, the family structure, is a way to get back to over, overarching determination, the determining structure that, lim that severely limits uh, capacities for individual agency. Um, but I, I do think that, at least in tension with these other forces, it can bring out something like an aim for agency, that, that there is something very, very effective about about having a, a sense of not only underlying uh, determinations, but also of, of insides and outsides. Um, 
it perhaps, and this gets back to the stuff that was talked about earlier about an insistence on separation um, and uh, what reasoned uh, hatred, I think it was. Um, uh, but that it's effective in bringing ourselves politically uh, into focus in order to to bring ourselves into focus, we have to not only kind of um, elaborate and envision our aims and desires, but also uh, our obstacles, right? Our enemies, what's in the way. Um, otherwise, not just subjects and objects, but also objectives are prone to lose their edges, to become porous, to disperse. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is just that there's a, um, there's a, Similarity in the work that Sabine and um, Judy showed, at least the first film, uh, Dysfunctional or This Functional House, um, in, in terms of starting with a historical object. And you can think of this, can you go to the next one? And you can go to the next one. You can think of this in terms of um, work today that deals with um, kind of uh, digging up uh, past material. You see a lot of past material being brought into a, to recent bricolage and, um, and new sculpture. But that stuff reminds me a lot more of uh, what people talk about as the aftermarket, thrift stores and eBay, or the way that movies uh, function in a huge database like Netflix, um, where, where um, past objects are are seized on and capitalized because they've gotten at the moment where they're starting to lose their former function or signification and they become kind of floating signifiers that can be filled anew uh, and given a new value. Um, that work tends to kind of highlight, again, individual imagination and expressivity and spontaneity. The work of the last artist that you showed. Anna. Yeah, Anna. And um, perhaps, Dysfunctional House um, is, it's not Dysfunctional House, Dysfunctional family. family, yeah. <laughs> Again, I'm like oversaturated with American TV. Um, it's not so much about what gets called aftermarket, it's more about aftermath, I would want to say. It's about a certain form of, of translation and recreation. Um, I think that the retrieval and translation that goes on with the historical object that's at the basis of this work undoes, on one hand, the neutrality of the original document, but <clears throat> also provides something like a check against kind of artistic whim and um, free subjectivity or authorial impulse. Um, there's something almost humbling about um, the, this presence of the past in uh, the work, and it's also the occasion for a commitment of a lot of labor and time to learn and research and look at um, this extant piece of history. Um, this careful kind of preservationist gesture that's in both of these works expresses both a desire for access to that past and also a distance from it, a kind of melancholic uh, remove, rather than do it yourself or DIY, perhaps you could say this work is more CSI. CSI? Again, <laughs> America. Quisieran hacer alguna pregunta a miembros de este panel? Gracias. No hay preguntas. Hola. Eh, solamente quisiera que Judy, eh, si pudiera hablar, si pudieras hablar un poco más acerca de la película que vimos esta, la, la primera, la de la casa, eh, porque bueno, hay una cantidad de, 
significados, ¿no? que, que podría, una cantidad de lecturas. Y, y quisiera saber cuál es la que a ti te interesaba y cuál fue la que, la que más destacó una vez que, si entendí bien, se proyectó en la televisión abierta este, y si correspondieron pues, tus intenciones a, a, a lo que ocurrió. Y, um, y, y bueno, a mí se me hace que tiene un significado como muy político, muy, muy fuerte la cuestión de la… tal vez estoy entendiendo todo totalmente mal, ¿no? Pero pienso que esta cuestión de poner en, el, en la recreación de los dueños a gente negra y a las, y a las mates, en, eh, gente blanca, en aquel contexto tendrá una, un significado como muy, muy, muy político. Pero yo, yo no sé si eso es cierto o no. Entonces, si pudieras hablar un poco de eso, por favor. Eh, hablo con este. Eh, sí, bueno, eh, creo que la idea justamente era cómo hacer una película con esa multiplicidad de lecturas, eh, no, no, no un reduccionismo. Y sí, evidentemente hay un contenido político y seguramente la debes haber entendido bien. ¿Y, y co correspondió pues lo que tú querías con, lo que, con, con la lectura que se le dio en la, ya, ya una vez que pasó en la, en la televisión allá? Perdón. Digo que si, digamos, tú tenías como una serie de, de unas intenciones. Quiero saber si eh, esas intenciones fueron transmitidas y si basándote en la retroalimentación que hayas obtenido, pues, de la gente de allá, quiero saber si esas intenciones se lograron, si lograste tú, eh, eh, si es Mira, que había objetivos eh, la concretos. La gente, pues. o sea, la vio en sus casas y luego también eh, los del Netherland Architectural Institute, eh, les gustó mucho la película y la querían mostrar en una sala como museo y también se mostró ahí y bueno, yo luego me fui de Rotterdam así que no, no sé Eso es todo, gracias <risa> 